This podcast is free and it's accessible to everyone thanks to support from listeners like you. If you value this show, please consider supporting its production by donating to our home, KUOW. It only takes a minute to give and you'll be helping to support the production of this podcast. Make a donation at KUOW.org or follow the link in the show notes. And thanks. Hi, everyone. I hope this finds you well. If you're a long-time listener to The Wild, then you probably know I'm a cat person. Not the kind that hang around your house. They're nice too, love cats. But I really love big cats. <laughs> I've got a remote wildlife camera out in my local forest near my house. I live near Bellingham in Washington State. It's just one camera out there as kind of an experiment to see what walks by. It's always like Christmas checking it. Last time I had two different cougars and a bobcat on it. All very cool. We've done a few big cat episodes, including cougars, mountain lions, some of you call them, and my trip to Russia to find Siberian tigers. Today, though, it's jaguars, back in the jungles of Belize in Central America. I became pretty obsessed in my search for these cats, and the search led me to some wonderful people who are out to understand and protect the jaguars. Some of them are part of the story. And hey, if you missed the last episode, it was about Scarlet Macaws, also in Belize. Check it out. It's a great introduction to the people and the wildlife there. So kick back, lend me your ears, and join me on the path of the jaguar. I'm so glad you're here. I'm at Caracol at the temple, staring straight at it right now, and it's amazing. It's breathtaking. I'm in Belize, in Central America. I start up the steps of the temple. Each one is about knee height. It's like climbing a pyramid, except this one is in the middle of the jungle. Well, they're behind me then and nearly toppled over. I'm here to learn about the story of the biggest wild cat in the New World, the jaguar. And the Caracol Temple seems like a good place to start. Okay, the jaguar was a very symbolic animal that represented power and authority for Mayas. Geronimo Zeb is a historian. He's shown me around the place for the day. As a Mayan, he has a special relationship with Caracol. He stopped at the bottom of the steps to say a prayer before telling me more. It's more a spiritual connection of the gods to the Mayas because then that's how they would petition for favors from the god. And also decorating the temple means that it's a very sacred place as well. Would the jaguar almost be a god? Was it was it something that they they respected it's, and revered? And it's pretty much like today. When we see a jaguar, we're pretty amazed, thrilled because it's not something that we normally see everyday life. The jaguars are almost invisible here, living in an almost impenetrable jungle. Over 60% of Belize is in a natural wild state and not developed. A huge amount. A lot of it's protected rainforest, jungle. There are big reserves in the north and the south parts of the country. But in the central part, development is increasing. Jungle is turning to farmland along the main highway that literally divides Belize in two. The country is close to losing that last forested connection between the jungles in the north and the jungles in the south. And this is a problem, because the key to the big cat's future is connectivity. If their pathway through the middle of the country is cut off, it could be devastating for them. So, it's all about saving parcels of rainforest in central Belize before they're lost. The pieces in between the reserves. This is my journey, from the north to the south, through what's called the Maya Forest Corridor. I'll get to know the place and the people fighting to maintain the path of the jaguar. And my fingers are crossed. Maybe I'll even see one along the way. But before I set off, Geronimo helps me out with one last little detail. At the beginning of every episode, I say, um, I'm Chris Morgan. Welcome to the wild. How do I say welcome to the wild in in, uh, Maya? Tene, Chris Morgan. Kotene ishtik asho. Tene, Chris Morgan. Kotenestik Asho. Tene? Tene, Chris Morgan, Kotenestik Asho. Welcome to the wild. Come on, 
Jaguar gods. Help me. Help me find you. It's 6 a.m. in the jungle. I'm here because I've been told it's one of the best places to see a jaguar. Good habitat and a well-protected private reserve. It's all about being in the right place at the right time. And you would think that this time of day in this location, this is where the jaguar would, would be. But who knows? They have their own rhythms and habits. But truth be told, this is my fourth straight day of searching. I'm pretty tired and covered in insect bites and very sweaty. And no luck so far. These cats are supremely good at hiding. Their lives depend upon it for catching prey and avoiding humans, it seems. I'm beginning to think the Mayan gods have failed me. I am looking at every single bush, every dark hole in the jungle, under every palm, just to see if I can see a face or a shape or something in there. Every, I'm scanning every inch with my binoculars now. No more messing around. I'm in an area called Gallon Jug, towards the north of Belize. If you look at the satellite view on Google Maps, it's right in the middle of a big swath of green rainforest. Belize is small. You could fit more than five of them into England. It's about the size of Vermont. But despite its size, it's packed with biodiversity and has done an amazing job at protecting nature, especially big forests like this, and all the life they support. It's the perfect place for me to begin learning about the home of the jaguar. Oh, I was just walking down the trail here, and suddenly a giant heavy nut landed on the ground next to me. Like that. <laughs> it just missed me. I look up, and through the palms, about 90 feet above me in a tree, is a spider monkey, a female with her baby. I can't tell if she's eating nuts or just throwing them at me. Whoa, that one just hit me. Right on the shoulder. She obviously doesn't like the fact that I'm this close to her. Oh, I just got a splash of something on my face. I think that might be monkey pee. Yep. <laughs> oh, that's amazing to see. She's climbing across this bow now with her, with her young clinging onto her. Wiping the pee from my brow, I refocus a little bit lower down. Looking for jaguars starts with looking for their prey, and they have no shortage of bite-sized options around here. A couple of favourites include the armadillo, and a creature you usually smell before you see, the peccary. They're like a miniature wild boar with a full-size attitude. Oh, OK, this looks like the dominant male. He's getting pretty agitated, telling us to back up. That loud clacking sound is the dominant male peccary slamming his back teeth together to warn the others that I'm here. Listen to that. He's staring right at me here. He's just facing off. His hackles are all up. He's making that intimidating sound to make sure that I know he knows we're here. He'd make that same sound if a jaguar was creeping up on them. These are so important for jaguars. These are like the cheeseburgers of the rainforest. Thankfully, they bolt away from me into the forest. And it's not just the monkeys and peccaries you've got to watch out for here. The plants are out to get you as well. I nearly stabbed my head with a thorn that looks like it would pierce my skull. That's beautiful, these musical thorns. Each one of them's about two inches long and as sharp as a needle. Wow, sounds like a musical instrument when you pluck them. Mesoamerica, this northern part of Central America, covers about half of 1% of the world's land area. But it has 17% of all land species. The place is throbbing with life. The day goes fast, and darkness happens quickly around six o'clock all year round here. So I head back to base with one thing on my mind. Nothing's better than a nice cold beer. 
Emil Flutter works at the Jungle Lodge I'm staying at, and not only does he serve ice-cold beers, but I found out he loves wildlife too. And I'd love to talk to you a little bit. Have you, um, have you got a few minutes to talk about your photographs? and Sure. Stuff? That looks good. He pulls out his phone and starts to scroll through. Um, I got the a spider monkey. Oh, wow, really? Crossing the walkway here in the lodge. Some of them he's taken with a long lens camera, but he's also put out a hidden wildlife camera. He checks it on his time off. This is the puma. Then a glimpse of what I'm here searching for. That there is the jaguar. Oh, okay. Yes. There's the jaguar. And this guy looks like it's a male. It's huge. Huge. This sounds so very stocky. big. It's yes. got such powerful yes. legs, and, and, but not long. They're just all muscle mm. and power, aren't they? Beautiful patterns. Look at that face. The jaguar looks otherworldly. Oh, yes. Maybe because there's nothing like it where I've ever lived. Exotic and stunning. Its orangey coat is covered in large black spots called rosettes. And at first glance you might think leopard, but jags are bigger, six feet long plus a tail that adds another three feet. A big male can be 250 pounds. A male feels like a kindred spirit. His love for these animals runs deep. Every time he has a day off from working behind the bar, he's out in the jungle trying to get that perfect photograph. It's like a therapy for me. You know, it's very, it's very, it's very special. I can, I can explain it. You know, um, all my free time, I just go out hearing the sounds of the birds. I think that that's my music. And ocelots, jaguar, pumas, gray foxes. In general, I just love animals. It's one thing seeing a jaguar on a camera trap like this, but Emil has had some personal contact with one of these cats too. And one morning, I was walking, and there's the jaguar on the front going, like 7.20 in the morning. So he's going, I'm start following the jaguar. So there was a curve on the road, I thought he left. But when Emil got to that curve in the road... He started coming towards me. So I just kneel on the ground, I start shaking, my heart's beating, and the jaguar just, wa- just um, steering on me. Emil was scared. He wasn't sure what to do, but eventually the Jaguar lost interest, turned around, and walked away. So that's the time I start loving those animals. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. How far away was he? It was not far, about 100, 100 yards. Emil's photographs and that experience inspired me. I've not seen a Jaguar face to face, at least I don't think I have but everyone tells me they've probably seen me. One night, I'm on this steep trail in the pitch dark, wearing my headlamp, and I see something. And I just saw two massive pairs of eyes looking back at me with my headlamp. And then they disappeared. They blinked twice and then disappeared. It was a cat for sure. Just like the eyes of a house cat shining in the car headlights, only much bigger. I've got my bright flashlight out now to see if I can see anything moving, but wow, the absolute silent. So this cat is either sitting very still about 20 feet away, or it is completely silent as it's moved through the trees away from me. Nothing like two big blinking eyes looking back at you from the rainforest in the pitch dark to get your heart rate up. I stand there for five minutes watching, but there's nothing. Whatever it was, it just evaporated right in here. I'll never know if it was a jaguar, but it's only supercharged me even more to understand these cats. Well, this is an amazing country. It has a lot of um, greenery, um, uh, there's a lot of forest, and I'm like, yes, that's the most proud of thing about Belize that I enjoy the most. Emma Sanchez is a jaguar biologist with a wild cat conservation organization called Panthera. She manages a national database of camera traps and does jaguar research surveys. Emma grew up in the north, not far from here, and she tells me her hometown used to be surrounded by jungle, 
but it's been completely developed now. There is no jungle left. It's sad to, to see um, where we're heading at, but I, I think at the same time, I, I understand that there has to be some sort of development, but also we need to think about the environment, think about everything else that lives in there, and one of them is a jaguar. And there is still time to preserve enough land to ensure a viable Maya forest corridor. But like all conservation efforts, there are politics and competing interests. And I think Belize is still in a position that we can make the right decisions and go in that direction. And, and I hope that the people in charge are able to do that and, and just guide the country in the right direction. I'm up early the next morning to pack up. Things are really starting to... Oh, stink. Today, I'm leaving this northern forest and heading to the southern jaguars on the other side of the Maya Mountains. Stick them in a sealed plastic bag in the very back of the truck. But on my way out, maybe I'll ask the guard at the gate if he's seen any jaguars. Senor, hay jaguar aquí esta semana? Sí, siempre sí. aparecen así. Sí. A veces así se cruzan así la calle. Of course he has. <laughs> he tells me there was one on the road right here just a few weeks ago. La tarde nochecita. Esta semana o no? O por el pasado. Por acá no, sí, a veces tal vez tiene como un mes que I drive south across Belize, out of the northern jungle, onto the western highway that cuts across the country. A highway that makes my trip easy, but is almost an impenetrable barrier for wildlife. Four hours later, and I've arrived in the southern refuge for jaguars. All right, Coxcombe Basin Wildlife Sanctuary. Picture of a jaguar on their logo. This is the place. Coxcombe is ground zero when it comes to protecting jaguars. In the 80s, thanks to the biologist Dr. Alan Rabinowitz, it became the world's first jaguar preserve, and it's where they've been studied the most. Coxcomb is named after the mountain peaks here. They look like the pointed comb on the top of a rooster's head. The reserve only measures 22 miles by 9 miles, but it's packed with interesting wildlife. As I drive into the reserve, I hear the sound of howler monkeys, Belize's largest primate. It feels like a perfect welcome to this special place. These vocalizations are designed to carry right through the jungle and they do a really good job of it to make sure that the other troops in the area know that this troop of howler monkeys is right here. <laughs> wow. Their call can be heard three miles away. They make the forest seem endless. Not surprising they use this sound, apparently, in the movie Jurassic Park for the sound of the Tyrannosaurus Rex. Even though Coxcombe is a wild rainforest, there's an amazing network of trails. And no sooner do I hit the ground to begin exploring, and there, another first for me. Track, track, Jaguar track. Fresh Jaguar track in the mud here. My first Jaguar tracks. To me, it's as good as the cat itself. Oh my God, it's like one track on top of another. The trail is muddy from the constant rain, so it makes the perfect substrate for finding fresh tracks. Yes. (laughs) Every detail of the print shows in the silt. Exciting. It's two tracks, one on top of another. It suddenly feels like I'm surrounded by Jaguars. And in some ways I am. Researchers here say that there are at least 60 jaguars using coxcomb. That's a high population density for a reserve that's only 200 square miles. And they live long lives inside the reserve, often over 10 years. But outside the reserve, jag densities are a lot lower because when jaguars leave the reserve to disperse into new areas, they're often killed on roads or shot on farms where they're seen as a threat to livestock. Jags try to avoid these human threats, but that's almost impossible when their habitat is being torn down. In one study, half the jaguars captured on cameras outside of Coxcomb 
were dead within two and a half years. Up north where I was in Galanjog is great jaguar habitat. It clearly is here too, in the south. But for a big cat, it's getting between these protected places that's the problem. And it's the whole reason to try and connect them with a corridor. I carry on a bit further down the trail, and there's something else. I just got another whiff of cat pee, and sure enough, it's coming from this tree in front of me here. And I can definitely smell it. The more miles I hike, the more jaguar sign I find. Check out these claw marks. Some of them look really fresh. Look how high they are. I'm six feet four, and I can't even reach that top one. Jaguars share the place with other big cats too. Pumas, mountain lions. There's enough food and space for both. They work around each other. Different places, different times, different food. I spend several days in Coxcomb, but it's finally time to head out of the reserve, to the middle of the habitat corridor. As I'm leaving, I run into one of the rangers, and of course he's eager to tell me about his recent sighting. You see, when you, when you get this curve here, yeah. going down the hill, the first going down the hill, yeah. Uh, that's where I saw Mama Jaguar with two cubs. No. Yeah, they were just walking on the road, you know, having fun. Oh. So I see that, I stop, you know, I cut off the ATV and was just sitting there and watch what they're going to do. Yeah. And they're coming, coming, coming. They're not paying no mind to me. Really? Yeah, they get close to me, like from here to the vehicle, and they just stop. And, wow, who is this? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. And they weren't too nervous? No. Wow. Yeah, they were very cute. Well, I love what he said. If we sat here for a week solid, he said we would definitely see a jaguar. That sort of renews my hope. Coxcomb and Gallon Jug up north, where jaguar numbers are healthy and protected, are really important because they're like reservoirs of jaguars. But the central part of the country, the part I so easily drove through to get here, still isn't protected enough to guarantee jaguars can do the same. So these two protected areas somehow need to be remain connected. And at this point, there's just, there's just only one option to have that happen. And, and, and that is from the, it's the area that we call the Maya Forest Corridor. That's a very essential, very important area that needs to be um, protected or somehow maintain the integrity of the forest so that we can keep the, these two blocks connected. Jaguars need to be able to cross this area of agriculture and avoid highway traffic to maintain genetic flow. For example, when a southern male cat mates with a northern female, the genetic health of the population improves. Because he's taken his genes that was from down there, taken up northern into northern Belize, and that's where the connectivity remains. Once there is a barrier to that, then the populations will become isolated. And, and, that's, and that's where the danger starts. Um, as soon as the population is isolated, it, it, is, it has a higher risk of being um, extinct. After the break, I'll take you to a place that shows what success looks like in central Belize, a piece of land that has become part of the solution, right in the middle of the Jaguar's habitat corridor. I'm Alex Schwartz. I'm Nomi Fry. I'm Vincent Cunningham, and this is Critics at Large, a New Yorker podcast for the culturally curious. Each week, we're going to talk about a big idea that's showing up across the cultural landscape, and we'll trace it through all the mediums we love. Books, movies, television, music, art. And I always want to talk about celebrity gossip, too. Of course. We hope you'll join us for new episodes each Thursday. Follow Critics at Large today, wherever you get podcasts. Cutting across Belize from east to west is Belize's busiest highway, the Western Highway. 
And next to it, another road, the coastal highway that cuts southeast, is in the process of being paved to allow for more traffic. It feels like this backhoe is literally digging away a jaguar habitat here. The land alongside each highway here is rapidly being transformed into mainly agricultural land and cuts a swath like a checkerboard across jaguar habitat. So the main contributor to fragmentation in this area is uh, large-scale agriculture for sugarcane, for citrus, um, corn. Those are kind of the, the three main crops. Dr. Kayla Hartwell is a wildlife biologist on a nearby nature reserve called Runaway Creek. Runaway Creek is a privately owned reserve, an example of how a pathway for wildlife in central Belize can be created. So there's this strip of maybe, I don't know, five kilometers or less, I think it's less now, where jaguars can safely pass through this region. Kayla works with Emma Sanchez and others to monitor the jaguars and other wildlife that pass through here. Development is making this corridor tighter and creating a bottleneck. So conservation organizations and donors are trying to buy up parcels of land to protect them from development and keep them wild. The jaguars don't need much, basically just enough forest to get through the area safely. Emma tells me the land parcels around here are essential. It's like a giant jigsaw. So we're missing that part of the puzzle to complete the path of the jaguar. And it's right here? And it's right here. As I was driving around the area, I saw a for sale sign swinging in the wind at the side of the highway. It said, cheap land. It's one of the problems conservationists face as they're trying to complete this puzzle. So I quickly jotted down the number. All right, let's see if this goes through. I decide to call the real estate agent to see what kind of price Jaguar Habitat goes for. Good evening. Hello, um, I'm calling about uh, some land that's for sale on the Western Highway, just east of the coastal road. And the sign said, 2,000 acres cheap. So first, first question is, how much is that, that piece of land if it's still for sale? Okay, it's 1.2 million US, which works out of 400 US an acre, which is really cheap for land. That's the problem. That's not cheap for a conservation organization. $1.2 million for 2,000 acres might be manageable for a developer, but it's not easy to come across that kind of money for wildlife protection. Um, yeah, I'm interested in any of those chunks. The price, whether they're forested. Okay. Um, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm coming at it from a wildlife person's perspective of trying to... That's what, that's what, that's what I assumed, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's a great area yeah. for wildlife, I presume, all that. Well, all... sure, sure it is. In fact, I understand there's a corridor near there, right? Right. The wildlife corridor? Yeah. I'm happy to hear he's heard about the wildlife corridor. Word is starting to spread. Buying land, habitat like this, and protecting it is essential. And nearby Runaway Creek, where Kayla Hartwell works, is one really great example of how that can happen. It's 6,000 acres and was bought in 1999 by the Foundation for Wildlife Conservation, saved from becoming a gravel mine to pave the highway. Now it's a nature reserve and an important link for wildlife moving through central Belize. It's a private reserve. So I think oftentimes people think of national parks and everything that it has to be a government designated area mm -hmm. but in reality that's pretty much what makes up the Maya forest corridor um, it's a bunch of private landowners that together were uniting to save the last remaining forest in this area Kayla and Emma agree to show me around runaway creek they tell me there's jaguar sign all over this forest and I can't wait to see how the cats use this landscape and some of its hidden features. We meet up with their colleague, Stevan Renault. Okay, so good morning again and welcome to Runaway Creek. Um, so it is the outline in red on this map, as you can see. Stevan is the director of environmental education here at Runaway Creek Nature Preserve. His colleague is sharpening his machete. Apparently he's going to need it where we're headed, into the jungle. 
where the team is monitoring jaguars. And somewhere about halfway of this ridge, there is two tunnels. So we're going to pass through one of the tunnel and circle back to the other. There's a series of caves on the property that were used as hiding places by runaway slaves. It's where the place got its name. Today, Stefan and the team are heading out to check several wildlife cameras, part of the monitoring program for jaguars. We'll be heading into the forest now, so we'll be walking single file. Okay. And we'll be pointing out what you can hold on and what not to touch. Yes. <laughs> You know, what's really curious about this place is that you, you come off the highway and it's busy and it's going to get busier. But uh, you come into this forest and suddenly it does feel like an oasis. There's sign of animal, various species everywhere and overgrown rainforest species that we're macheteing through right now. And jaguar beds and scent marking areas and it, it's, uh, it's thick with life. And just shows how important these pieces of the puzzle are for maintaining wildlife, you know, and keeping them around on a landscape like this when it's as busy as it is with people. <laughs> Nicely done. <laughs> what a pro. Wow, that is a sharp machete. I'm standing four or five feet behind you on purpose. <laughs> Every square inch has something living on it and puzzles to solve. We come across a turtle shell in some mud. That's a very interesting find. This turtle shell is at least a foot long, maybe eight or nine inches wide. Could this be the, the, the sign of a jaguar eating a turtle? If they didn't kill it themselves, um, they definitely fed on it. It looks like that could be a canine mm -hmm. hole, right? Yeah, this could be. Is there anything else in this forest that could have the power, the jaw power, to bite through that? No. Of the cats, they have the most powerful bite. We slosh through a little mangrove swamp and suddenly the sky darkens and out of nowhere, rain like I've never seen before. I make a run for it to catch up with Stevan, who's walking into a cave. Like this huge black doorway, out of the rain and into another world. I walk in slowly. It just makes you want to fall silent when you walk in here. It's taking my breath away. There are smooth shelves carved into the side of the wall here. And on those shelves are paintings, Mayan paintings. And oh my goodness, I think one of them is a jaguar. Spots down its spine and on its flanks. just got the chills. It looks like it could have been painted yesterday. An ochre coloured jaguar, about six, maybe seven inches high. You can see the spots on it. The jaguar is walking to the right towards a rectangle with a double circle in the middle. It's the first painting like it found in Belize, and there are only nine of them known in Mesoamerica. Stevan interprets the painting for me. So... The Mayas, they really they revere the jaguar due to the power of the cat. So, and the day, it's the sun. And at night, it transfers itself into a jaguar to pass into the underworld. This is exactly what you're showing. This is a cave. The Mayas call the cave the underworld. So, the cat is transforming itself from the sun into a jaguar to pass into the underworld, Shibalba, which they are, and then comes out in the morning as the sun again. Do you know how old these paintings are? Yes, these paintings are about, from like 380, so that's like 1700 years old. There are pieces of pottery here. Twenty or thirty fragments of them. There's a, a crushed peccary skull, which is looks like it's been attacked and bitten into this skull by a large carnivore, probably a jaguar. There's some bones here. Oh, it's a treasure trove. It's just blowing my mind. Okay, back on the trail to check the cameras. 
That's what we're here for, but I, I just didn't expect this surprise detour into this cave. It's just absolutely incredible. We walk through the cave. It's a tunnel connecting two parts of the jungle through the middle of a mountain, right here in the heart of the Maya Forest Corridor. Then we enter a second cave. There are eerie-looking monkey faces carved into the limestone. And there's a surprise here, too. So we're inside the tunnel now. Hey, look! The jaguar tracks. There are cat tracks everywhere, different sizes in the soil of the cave floor. The tracks have been sheltered from the rain here, so they're as clear as the day they were pressed into the ground. And this one, I would say, probably like a few days old. It's a, it's a, it's a nice clear print when you shine your flashlight on it like that yeah. sideways. It shows up very well yeah. in the depths of this cave. Amazing to think of them walking through here. It's pitch dark, so our headlamps are now on. A bat circles us, and then, poof, we trigger a camera trap. The team monitors several of them to see how many jaguars and other species are moving in or through the reserve in this part of the corridor. Kayla takes out the memory card to see what's on it, and we all huddle around. The excitement is up, guys. <laughs> Literally, my heart pounded. It is nuts. This is, I feel like I'm in a weird dream with all these strange new friends. <laughs> the camera's memory card is almost full. Surprisingly, there's been a lot going on here. First up is one of the main jaguar prey species. What is that? Uh, paca or gibnut, the largest rodent. Okay. It looks like a 25 pound guinea pig with spots. A tasty treat for a hungry feline. Kayla clicks through more photos. There's another possum. Possum. Nothing. Jaguar. Oh! Oh my god! So this is Big Eye. So this is the, the jaguar that we... He's a, real, he's a beautiful, healthy-looking male. The first image only shows his head and one leg, but Kayla recognizes Big Eye instantly. And the reason why we call him Big Eye, it's hard to tell on... on this shot, but it's almost like he has this big, exaggerated eyebrow. I see. So he has this um, dark line that creates a perfect eyebrow right above his, his eye. There he is, walking right where we found the tracks. His mouth is open, he's got huge canine teeth, his head is massive and muscled, and he's got this purposeful stride. I feel like I've found my Jaguar, right where I least expected it. And he wasn't alone. The camera has captured other cats, too. There we have a Puma. Wow. Ooh, an ocelot. Wow. Cool. Okay, that is amazing. That's three species. Three species of big of cats, cats in yes. this one cave. The three over. largest. These are the three largest. That's three of Runaway Creek's five cat species. And Big Eye wasn't the only jaguar that had been in here. There's another male and two females. Four jaguars, two pumas, and one ocelot. All on one camera in a cave. And like the cave itself, Runaway Creek is sheltering them in this in-between world. There are 50 caves at Runaway Creek. It's magical to think of all the animals using them. It's a place that's always been a shelter for humans and animals. And what's clear is that it's an essential part of the Maya Forest Corridor puzzle and an example of what's possible. And there's land that's disappearing all around us. And so Runaway is kind of a stronghold in this area where we know that Runaway Creek will always it, it will always be protected. There are several parcels of land here that could follow the example of Runaway Creek and become part of the Maya Forest Corridor. Preserving corridors for jaguars also preserves habitat for so many other species and maintains fresh water and healthy functioning ecosystems that benefit all of Central America. And it's not just the big forests that the jaguars need. 
but also the pieces in between, but together they are formidable. The people working to preserve the path of the Jaguar know that, and perhaps the Mayan gods do too. The wild is inspired not just by nature, but by people who work in it, love it, protect it. You can learn more about the Maya Forest Corridor and how you can help on our website, thewildpod.org. Be sure to check out our Instagram account, at thewildpod, and you can find me at Chris Morgan Wildlife. A very special thank you for their kind financial support to Rose Letwin, Jill and Scott Walker, Ellen Ferguson, Anna Kimball, John Taylor, Mark and Rebecca Wilkins, Bob Yellowlees, and Paul Lister, and to Paul's organization, the European Nature Trust, for making this trip to Belize possible. Thanks to Bart Harmson, Marcella Kelly, and Hugh Robinson for their knowledge and help, and all the people of Belize who made us so welcome and helped out along the way. I really fell for your beautiful country. The Wild is a production of KURW in Seattle and me, Chris Morgan, with support from Wildlife Media. Our producers for this episode are Brenda Phillips and Matt Martin. Jim Gates is our editor. Our production team includes David Brown, Juan Pablo Chiquiza, April Craig, Kara McDermott, Tio Popescu, Darcy Riggins-Schmidt, and Brendan Sweeney. Our theme music is by Michael Parker. I'm your host, Chris Morgan. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoy the wild, please do ask your friends to follow our podcast. And if you have a chance, please give us a review. Thank you and take good care. <laughs>